A very, very warm welcome to everybody tonight for, I've slightly lost track of how many of these Lambeth food stories we've done. Bit of a plug for them. If you've not, I think we've done six, but maybe more. Um, if you've not yet um, listened to them, then they are all on our YouTube channel. So um, they're all very different and um, quite exciting to have a look at the breadth of things that, that we've um, highlighted. Um, but today we are talking about space in Lambeth and a lot of the work we've been doing at IEL has been about um, seeing how we can work collaboratively to improve the green spaces in our borough. Um, and I think this year that has really been highlighted the need for better green spaces we've got our beautiful parks many a highly you know green flag highly awarded wonderful spaces um, but there are other spaces that are neglected and very sad and they don't need to be that way and so we've been trying to work um, collaboratively with residents and the council to see how that can change and we were very fortunate to get some money from the mayor of london to work across six estates to work on a template of engagement to see how residents can um, get more closely involved and engaged in the management of the land right on their doorstep. And you're going to hear from a couple of um, people who are co coordinating the work on their estate, which will be fabulous. You'll also hear from um, Poppy, um, Poppy George, who is managing this project for us. Uh, first of all, though, we are really, really delighted to have Judy Ling Wong with us. And um, Judy is a pretty extraordinary woman and um, very inspiring to, to hear what she has to say because she's looking at the big picture and has done for very many years and has been looking at the potential for, of green space within our social housing for decades. She was one of the founders of London National Park City, and she pushed for recognition of these spaces, playing an important role as spaces for connection to nature and contributing to wildness for some of our most deprived communities in London. So Judy, thank you very much. We're looking forward to hearing from you. So good evening, everyone. It is great to be here to talk to you all about the exciting prospect of reimagining urban green spaces where we live and work. This is in particular about recognizing the fact that in so many London boroughs, there's more green space around social housing than all the public parks and gardens put together. But often this space is neglected so that it remains as areas of mown lawn that is not made the most of. I will spend five minutes setting the scene against a policy landscape and then go on to share exciting examples of reimagining a whole range of spaces, including social housing, that can form a network of greenery to transform our urban lives. It is connectedness that will ultimately unlock the potential of green areas to be greener, healthier and wilder, better for nature and for people at the same time. Before I start, let me say that you'll find a lot of text on my PowerPoint. I will not even attempt to read them all. I will just pick out key points and speak about them. This is the way in which I work. The text is there as notes for you, and most of it is obvious, so I will not spend time on details. You will have it all as you are welcome to the PowerPoint, so do not worry about taking notes. Just listen and enjoy the talk, which is full of beautiful and stimulating images. So, I am a poet, painter and environmentalist, best known as the president of Black Environment Network. My work with Ben has been focused on multicultural environmental participation. You know, this work has been very much set against the urban context because where 
That is where most multicultural communities are, with many of us living within social housing estates. Sustainability depends on the relationship of people to nature brought out so starkly by the experience of COVID and the relationship of people to each other, also accentuated by communities helping each other throughout the COVID crisis. And social housing and other neighbourhood arenas are where these relationships can be built and extended. So COVID, Black Lives Matter and the theme of resilience is set within the climate emergency, which all accentuate the need to address diversity, equality and inclusion. And access to nature is one of our keys as a springboard for inclusive action across social, cultural, environmental and economic means. So, 30 years ago, we said that there's no such thing as a purely environmental initiative. A so-called purely environmental initiative is one that has rejected its social, cultural and economic dimensions. The most forward-looking policy at the moment comes out of Wales, their Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, where they say a more equal, prosperous, resilient, healthier and globally responsible Wales with cohesive communities and a vibrant culture and a thriving Welsh language that goes beyond simple GDP measure towards what affects the economic, social, environmental and cultural well-being of Wales. Notice those four words again, economic, social, environmental and cultural. And the UK-wide bill is still going through Parliament. And this has been realised at the very top at Global Policy. The first Global Stakeholders Forum was held in 2019 at the UN and they produced alongside that a strategy that chimes into the new urban agenda, which basically says on the top left, leave no one behind. So, greening our multicultural city is about championing people-centred policy, addressing discrimination and prejudice, enabling access to nature, and reimagining and co-creating actions. We are not at square one. Climate change has really pushed us to be very aware of diversity and equality, and there's a rising generation of environmental activists from the Bain community. And this is an example of what is happening, an open database of 100 of the most established voices in the UK environmental moment, movement. And this is very important for Lambeth and for London. So let's go on to the fun part, the reimagining and transformation of the local built environment, unlocking the agency of ordinary people. In the work of Ben, we found that when you work with the most deprived communities, when they realize their potential, they have double the energy of the mainstream community. And we can transform where we live and work, our streets, other spaces within our built environment with attention to processes and creating policy and community connections. So let's start with transforming the local environment in practice. Look at this. These are back gardens where the walls have been broken down, creating a lush and impossible looking oasis right in the middle of dense housing. We can see that if we put our minds to it, we can transform spaces in all kinds of ways. And in Liverpool, what have they done? Wildflower meadows on a grand scale against social housing. So impressive. Can we do this here? Yes, we can. So some of these spaces you have seen, for example, they've also paid attention to walls as spaces for greenery. And then the pavements. This area has been transformed so much by planting in tree pits and letting front gardens spill onto the pavement and so on, that you can hardly notice the cars. And this is in Vauxhall, in the residential area. One thing to remember is in all residential areas, whether it is small houses in streets or council estates and so on, the only 
only cars in those streets are residents' cars. The only people walking on the pavements are residents and their friends. And you can reclaim this space to be oases like this. All you have to do is leave enough space for a buggy and a wheelchair to get through, and you are there. So spaces like this could look like just what I showed you. Just imagine, instead of these bleak spaces, places spilling onto the pavement and doing all sorts of things that reclaims the outdoor space for a neighbourhood. And they do. And every neighbourhood needs a small shop like that, a small cafe. And on Sundays and so on in this area in Vauxhall, people bring out their table tennis tables and completely are in the streets. This can happen anywhere. So look at these spaces. What can we do with them? They're huge spaces. Look at those bollards. It's impossible. Where every bollard is, there should be a flower bed. And we have examples too from parks and gardens talking about sense of belonging. So in this park in Bradford, they have a space where they have recreated the Mergle Gardens. But small examples like this can happen in our parks, gardens and council estates too. And here we link into woodlands. London has woodlands too and heritage forests. And here in Nottingham, in their country park, they've allowed the Sikh community to come in and plant 300 trees to commemorate the birth of Khausa, their scriptures. And guess what? When they're finished with the ceremony and the wonderful things, all you are left with is pure woodland, but with terrific memories and meaning from the, for the community. And again, this can happen on a smaller scale in parks and gardens, small areas of commemoration of all kinds of cultural and social meanings that brings it to life for us. Skip gardens, we've heard about that, movable, so we can take confidence to create these things wherever we find space. And pots too, you don't just have open ground, any hard surface can be transformed. Look at this in the estate grounds, and the British are so good at turning a blind eye and letting things happen. So in the streets as well, or indoors in our homes, in COVID times, many people have begun to realise the importance of indoor plants. Look at these spaces. They can all be full of greenery and colourful flowers that transform our lives or become play spaces. So bonsai, for example, that's interesting. They're dwarf plants that are a cultural solution to a longing for wildness. If you look at these cliffs in China, the small plants clinging in those cracks to life are actually survivors in harsh climate and they've become stunted plants. But the Chinese took that as a symbol of the mobility, the nobility of the struggle of the human spirit and create these dwarf plants to link themselves to wildness. But all our indoor plants and minorities would love this if they do the research, link us to the great forests of the world because these plants that are suitable for the indoors are on the forest floor where there's very little light. And businesses can do that bit. Look, what a difference. Just a couple of very beautiful plant pots. And there you are transforming the feeling of a neighborhood. Murals anywhere reminding us of nature. And even pedestrian crossing, this is in Brixton, can be services for creativity. And with the closing of roads and so on, and the creation of cycle paths, we can imagine there's much more artistic creativity that can take place on the roads and on pavements. And Kilburn Underground, look what they've done with their ticket offices. They are now plantarians. So you can see there are opportunities everywhere creating an atmosphere that's very different if we want it. And art, of course, is wonderful, whether at a high artistic level or at a communal level. And then green space is a springboard for change. Nothing stands alone. We have to pay attention to processes of engagement with ideas and experiences further afield. Here's a group going to Oxford, visiting the first Harlyle farm in the country, where the Asian farmers 
who have taken this over now have built their own hand-built five-room country house all by hand with traditional methods that are environmentally friendly. But linked to opportunities of all kinds include green jobs. It is about building a movement. And our very own miners feel huh? they notice processes, you know. Once they notice that communities wanting to grow food had a lack of greenhouses to start early enough in the season to have a long growing season to harvest food for themselves. They offered the service of planting pluck plants for them to collect. So they start really early in February and March. People come and collect them. They started three years ago with only 5,000. After three years, they're doing 50,000. The growth of food growing, the excess land is so important. The people are planting them everywhere on balconies, backyards, front gardens, and so on. And Barking, Barking and Dagenham has this wonderful project where they transform a warehouse where people can make things and talk about planting and help upskill each other. And of course, we have our very own natural thinkers with outdoor learning in all our schools. But there are 10 commitments for land that is suitable for natural thinkers' activities. Give us clues as to how there can be multiple uses for land leading to informal learning for families and for especially our children. So processes are so important. You have heard about the redoing of Grosvenor Square in Mayfair. They have so much money, you know, they actually threw money at the process of consultation. But the process is superb and an ex example of good practice that we can all learn from. And then a great need for things like bike workshops, because it's all very well saying we need to get on the bicycle, but many of us cannot afford it. And we also need places to fix them as well. Linking into history and heritage and going further afield to visit beautiful places where our history is embodied. Making the most of London's canals, which go right into the countryside. And then food from countries of heritage is so important for our multicultural communities. And then art, raising issues of recycling and having fun. And then different languages on our reports is so important too, to involve people intimately. And then look at what Scotland is doing, planting a complete new forest in the land and involving refugees. And we have London groups, you know, who go far afield to visit our national parks and become inspired to come back and create more green. Or going into the countryside, building friend friendships and networks through having pleasure together. So these are some of the ways of framing sustainability and participation, especially linking to environmental and non-environmental core aims like health and well-being citizenship, diversity, unlocking a vast missing contribution so that everyone sees themselves as stakeholders and we can have champions inside communities who do in-reach instead of outreach. And the UK can really get stuck into the new urban agenda of leaving no one behind. So building an inclusive movement, London National Park City is certainly doing it. And the ecology approach that is urban is extremely important. So ways of thinking and seeing are of vital importance to us. So London National Park City on their website signposts people to make the most of London. And that is really important for everyone. They are unlocking a vast contribution by capacity building information and programs of activities. Now, programs of activities are really important. Besides greening, at states, our parks and gardens, this is where it really ropes people in and make things happen. And then amplifying local and global voices and networks, events which bring people together. And then these events are left on websites for everyone to share and hear about examples all over the country, in London and in the world. 
So co-creating exciting solutions for people-centered policy, representative voices and so on, really can take us on the road to improving living conditions and the environment, saving us so much money in health and well-being, providing programs of activities and championing <coughs> diverse people and their agency to transform. So these are some notes for you about representation, engagement and provision, but you can read that later. So if not now, then when? Sustainability is about building a multicultural world where people and nature thrive together. And from the ageless wisdom of the East, they say policy is the expression of love wisdom and its outcome is beauty. When you look at what has happening with COVID, all those words, caring, protecting, they're in continuity with the word love. And in the East, they call it love wisdom because it's a love that is strategic and connects us to real actions to change the world. And when we do things well, its outcome is beauty, the beauty of relationship to people and the beauty of relationship to nature, both helping us to have an optimistic vision of the world to come that we will build. Thank you for listening. Judy, thank you so much. So much to um, get our heads around and um, inspire us. Very, very exciting to see the big picture and to realize that all of us can uh, make a difference by coming together. So I really appreciated that because you've got this sort of breadth of knowledge. And what was exciting for me was so many of those illustrations are actually in the Borough of Lambeth. And I feel that we are on the road, um, we are making a difference and we know um, we've got quite a few council reps here tonight. We know that uh, things are changing and we can all work with the council to make those changes. I've got a thumbs up from Linda, which is excellent. So, um, I'm now going to hand over to on our Grow Back Greener on Estates project where we're working on six estates and she's going to tell you a little bit about um, where what we've done so far and um, where we're at. So to you Poppy. Thanks Janie. So I did have a PowerPoint that had been put together for me, but I'm afraid I'm having real trouble sharing it. So I'm just gonna talk to everybody for five minutes about what we're doing. So Incredible Edible Lambeth applied for the Grow Back Greener Fund from the Mayor's Fund for, and it was in two parts. One side of it is working on six different estates in Lambeth, um, two a housing association, four are council estates, and it was to really put the power into people's hands, into residents' hands, to start reimagining their green spaces, their communal spaces that they call home, and to make them into places that they want to enjoy and to realize the value of them, I guess, and bring communities together. The other side of the funding was to create a template of engagement around green spaces and how we can reimagine how these green spaces are managed by the council um, and also how we all relate to them like they're parts of people's homes they're not just amenity land that needs managing and cutting um, and to make them you know the potential for making them more beautiful so this webinar has come off the uh, really is through the template of engagement that we created we thought we'd have this webinar to introduce it um, when we were doing the webinar, we had Zoom meetings. Obviously, we've been in a pandemic, so it was all done by Zoom. And we had residents from six different Lambeth estates. Um, and we were thinking about questions about what would people like their estates to look like, um, how we can make the maintenance of estates more sustainable. So composting, reusing materials, reusing wood chip, all of these things that are quite simple doesn't really happen on estates at the moment and they benefit the whole cycle of nature and of people really connect being connected to that cycle is really important and through their estate lands that's a great opportunity for people to connect to nature 
Um, we've also been, it's an opportunity for everyone to work with the council. They've written recently the Biodiversity Action Plan will shortly be, it's in the draft phase at the moment, but the council are really thinking about these things. They're thinking about biodiversity. They have, they have a, um, a commitment to try and be zero carbon by 2030, I believe, as a council. So these are things that are on everybody's agenda. Um, so it's a really exciting time for people to collaborate and to kind of co-design a new way of relating to space to make it like more beautiful and more enjoyable for everyone. Um, we also were looking at food security, creating more food growing options for residents, which I think the pandemic really highlighted as well how having sustainable access to food sources is really important and also maintaining knowledge. I, I, you guys probably all know this already, but, <laughs> but you know, I'll just say it again. Um, so that was another one of the drivers for creating the template. Um, and really it was about valuing green space and creating a template that would enable residents to have a clearer path to how they can engage in their green space and to create like a new dialogue really on estates within communities and with the people who manage the space, um, the council, the, um, the landscaping employees, how we communicate all together as a group of people who are all interested in these spaces and these spaces are important to us. Um, so yeah, we're really excited about the templates. It's on the Incredible Edible website, I believe. And we're really interested in talking to more people about it, getting feedback from people about if we've missed anything, what, what they think about the template and if they feel like it can be useful to kind of help us make, big, make change in how we approach and share our green spaces. So that's it, thank you. And I think we've got um, two representatives from two of the estates that have got funding who are in the process of making great things happen coming up next. So I think you're really gonna enjoy listening to them. Thanks, Thanks so much, Poppy. That's fantastic. Yes, the, the template is on the website and I can put the link in, in the chat in a minute. Um, and yes, we'd really value your thoughts and comments on it. It's a little bit long at the moment, we realise that, but there's so much we wanted to say. And it really grew out of um, a need that we sensed from residents who were coming to IEL saying, I really want to do more on my estate, but I just don't know how to start. So the, the, this didn't come out of nothing. This came from people like Jerome and Siobhan who were talking with us. They were members of IEL. They were frustrated that they couldn't do more. So you're now going to hear from Jerome first and then Siobhan. Jerome from Vauxhall Gardens Estate. We're really, really excited by what Jerome is doing there. So over to you, Jerome. Can you unmute yourself or do I have to do that for you? Ah. Hang on a second. There you go. Cool. Um, hi everyone. Um, I'd just like to thank um, Incredible Edible Lambda for um, being a platform and giving me an opportunity um, to represent my local community and transform um, green spaces. Um, I just wanted to kind of outline that it's about reimagining our green spaces. Um, it's not always about having the lawn. Do you know what I mean? It's about getting the residents input into what they want because it's technically their area that they that they live in. So. It's all about the residents. Um, also increasing food, like growing opportunities for residents. Um, obviously, you know, I'm not saying tomorrow, but if like most of our supermarkets were to, you know, say we don't have any food, how will we all survive? Um, so we need to build this kind of resilience as a community so that we can address 
um, food security and and just and just work together. Um, just like Poppy said, it's about communication and um, just communicating so that we can effectively work together and build cohesion. Um, so how I got involved in like local green spaces was um, in 2018, I studied at Woolworth Garden, which kind of gave me a foundation passion um, for horticulture and my local community. So I decided to um, join my local tenants residents association and um, just see what I could do, what I could action through kind of green spaces that are not being used. Um, yeah, um, my vision for this project in Vauxhall Gardens, um, it involves two polytunnels. One is to be to grow vegetable seedlings that can be given away to residents for free. And the other polytunnel is split in half with um, rare heirloom indoor plants, kind of like a Q vibe. Um, and then half of the other side is um, an indoor small classroom area where live um, guest speakers can come in and just uh, educate local residents about certain topics that they may be interested in. Um, so yeah, that's the kind of propagation area. We wanna have double native hedging around all the edges that ticks off the biodiversity um, plans with Lambeth um, addressing, you know, um, shelter and food for our, um, our insects and animals. Um, also, we I spoke to Ian Bolton from Lambeth just to get his input, and uh, we was thinking about getting a small pond, um, but he was telling me about um, kind of small depressions you can put into the land, and then when there's heavy rainfall, um, that water collects there, so you can kind of use that as well. Um, uh, we also want to include a small fruit orchard so we want residents to have access to organic grown local local food um, that they can you know at their pleasure just go outside in their local community and pick pick it when it's harvest time um, we also want to include because we're coming out of a pandemic you know um, mental health has skyrocketed um, we need places that is a form of healing um, so almost like a sensory garden or a type of mandala garden. Um, I think that would, that would work well to kind of help the local residents through healing. Um, we also want to um, kind of address like green roofs or blue roofs. So we spoke to Matt Panu from Lambeth as well and got his input into how we can, you know, harvest gray water um, and just be more sustainable. Um, uh, we want to include some wildflower meadows. So we want to um, provide food and shelter for pollinators and other beneficial insects. Um, we want to include the use of bird boxes and bat boxes because Lambeth is quite big on bat conservation. Um, uh, water capture feature and soil making. So we want to be sustainable. We want to close the loop of residents' kitchen scraps. Um, they can put their kitchen scraps in our compost bin and ultimately, over the long run, we can help to reduce uh, methane emissions um, and just be a more sustainable community. Um, although I'm leading the project um, or I'm coordinating the project, ultimately it's down to the residents. So when it goes to open consultation, um, there will be transparency, transparency and clarity, just so um, we work, we're working on behalf of the residents. So what they want ultimately, we can um, tailor the design and stuff to, to meet their needs. Um, so yeah, that's about it. It's just about being eco-friendly, um, increasing food production um, in this project, um, giving residents the, the impetus to, to just go out and at their will, just grow some seeds in their raised bed, do you know what I mean, or sit down um, in, in that area and, and feel a sense of um, relaxation. So yeah, that's kind of the scope of the project, the initial designs, but again, it will be tailored to what the residents want and input from other key people. Um, so yeah, that's the project. Um, I've been trying to 
kind of plan um, for the kind of the work, the, the actual work day. So um, we will have like probably over 30 people contributing um, on this day. So we want to be inclusive. Um, we want to get the residents on board and we want to transform our space into a, uh, a lovely um, teeming with wildlife and biodiversity, um, a sense of happiness and joy. Um, so yeah, if we can, like we say, bridge those gaps and work together to mold this project, I think that Lambeth could um, kind of pioneer a template that can be, um, you know, it can go over to other um, uh, boroughs and stuff, so yeah. Thanks, Jerome. Absolutely fantastic. Such a vision and um, totally what what we were all what we were hoping would happen. Um, so we're, we're so lucky to have you leading this project. Um, and also you've got such um, expertise from your horticultural training. So we're, it, that's brilliant. And I love that, you know, the residents are going to be at the core of any of the decision making that happens, which is absolutely essential if this is going to embed and last. So brilliant. Um, Siobhan, over to you. Myatsfield South. Um, Siobhan is representing Myatsfield South and is another of our Grow Back Greener estates. Uh, hi everybody, I, I, I just wanted to say thank you very much for the invitation to, to talk and to um, tell people a little bit about um, what we're planning here for Myatsfield South. Um, it's, I think it's an incredibly important project to be part of and I think just to echo something that Jerome just finished with saying was that if this template is successful and this pilot is successful, then it will evolve and it will um, it will spread. And I think there is there's been you know we've been through a lot with uh, the you know COVID has been a bit like being in a war wartime situation. I don't like to use those analogies, but we've had ten years of economic warfare against people and from the financial crash and we were just crawling out from under that and then we've had this shocking pandemic so people are um need something that they can coalesce around and i think the what one of the biggest things for me about the pandemic was the no planes no cars the massive increase in the visibility of wildlife birds i it felt very very different it felt like I'd gone back in time to my childhood I, I was brought up in rural Somerset even though my family are from Liverpool Liverpool Irish diaspora so um, I'm a country bumpkin at heart and um, I've lived on the estate for just over seven years we're tenants here and it is a very green estate um, but it has huge potential to be much more than that um, it has its own microclimate I believe um, and I got involved in a gardening project, um, the local community garden, um, but the, the resources were very scarce. So it caused conflict and it caused, it was, it was very tough um, at times uh, to uh, keep people together and to work as a team. So I live on the outer, ex the exterior of the estate. Um, I overlook Mostyn Road, and I have been looking at the derelict boiler site for <laughs> for four years. And um, I've always had, I've been trying for about three years to get this off the ground. And when Janie and Poppy said that about um, bidding for the Grow Back Greener Fund, I thought, well, this was the, the perfect opportunity to try and start transforming our mutual our, our uh, common green spaces so our plan is very similar we were going we are going to have um we're, we're creating a template um where the idea is to have um food growing space and to become much more food self-sufficient we're going to be um composting as well we are going to be um making making soil um we are also um going to incorporate um, uh, as part of the project is what is now called <laughs> loosely the dog toilet, um, which but actually which has real potential to be an ambient garden. Um, there are a lot of people who are quite isolated on the estate who live on the exterior of the estate. So in 
they live in studio flats and one, one bedroom flats like ourselves and they don't have much outside space um, so the focus in terms of resident engagement initially will be focused very much on the residents on this side of the estate and on the exterior of the estate who feel quite often um, not listened to or um, engaged with so um, I have a lot of really lovely neighbours who and I've made more friends neighbours starting to do this project and it really has started to bring people together already even though I've only just sort of cleared the site and we're just waiting for some um, the old infrastructure of the um, communal boiler, old communal boiler to be uh, decommissioned um, properly. Uh, so that'll be another couple of weeks. Um, but really, I, I, you know, if I had my way, it'd be like the 1970s in Somerset, <laughs> every part of Lambeth that you could possibly do that. But obviously I can't do that. But I'm very, very passionate about hedgerows, about biodiversity, about insect life, bird life. Um, when I grew up as a kid, we had slow worms in our garden and hedgehogs and, and things like that. And it's about trying to create buffers against decline and, and incorporate into that about giving people knowledge about food growing. Um, and I think what's very interesting about this estate because it has a large Caribbean population and Obviously, a lot of people from uh, from Caribbean islands were rural people who lived in, you know, who farmed or used land, you know, worked the land. So my idea is to create a sort of memory um, engagement process as well, where people have memories of um, maybe childhood memories or grandparents and about how the estate, um, how how the estate has changed in the time that they've lived here, because a lot of people have lived here for a long time. There is a bit more of a transient population now, but it's not too bad. Um, and I think what has been really inspiring for me as well is it's it's been a bit of a roller coaster, but I have to say that um, I, 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 having had a conversation with Ian Bolton today, telling him about our vision for a water capture system, for creating um, soft borders on the estate, with meadows and fruit trees and lots of pollinating um, species. Um, I, I, I just feel that this, we're on the cusp of something really wonderful here. And um, it's really important that people really start to see um, that the effects of climate change and, and of you know pollution and mitigating against that is going to involve everybody. We have to work together. I mean, I think one of the most important things for me be just before I finish is to say that um, having experienced um, through austerity um, food insecurity myself, myself, and my, my husband a few years back, um, I, I would never want to be in that position ever again where I didn't have enough money for food. And um, I think that we need to make sure there's enough for everybody and mother nature is bountiful as the, the ha wonderful project in you know the Mitesfield park project the greenhouses has has proved i mean it is just incredible how much they have done and for people in this local area and so i'm really interested in forming strong bonds and lots of really strong stronger relationships with my my friends and my neighbors and the local people in the lo local neighborhood so that's what I'd like to see. <laughs> Thank you, Siobhan. Thanks. Um, it just really, yes, a Tory's clapping. I mean, just reinforcing how incredibly important it is that we work together on this. And there's mm. so many brilliant people in the room today. So um, I would just like to highlight that Marge and Tory are very closely involved with Myers Field Park and have done so much of the work there. Um, we've got Rob and Thomas from Open Orchard. They're planting fruit trees all over the borough, which is just fantastic. <laughs> so, no, mostly West Norwood, but anyway, it's still fantastic. And uh, we've got Annalisa here. Annalisa's involved with St Martin's Estate, which is one of the Growback Greener Estates. Um, which is lovely. And Catherine Pengeli was here. She is involved with Central Hill Estate, um, the same project down there. So um, I think everybody recognises that this work needs to happen um, 
together if we are actually going to make a significant difference. Um, I'm just going to ask Patrick now. I'm trying to unmute you, Patrick, and I'm struggling. Can you see? If, oh, you can do it. I'm unmuted. Yeah, I can do it. Okay. Thank you, Janie. Just to introduce Patrick, he's a, um, he lives on Rosendale Estate and he was incredibly helpful in the um, consultation process with the template, um, helped us um, with that. And uh, Rosendale is an example of how an estate can really um, do things differently. So we're going to hear some of the projects that he's been involved with and Actually, Poppy also lives on Rosendale Estate, so the two of them are a bit of a powerhouse there. Over to you, Patrick. Uh, thanks, Jenny. Thanks. Evening, everyone. Um, yeah, I think the first question I was posed was how did I get involved with kind of like gardening on Rosendale Garden? Rosendale Gardens is the name of our estate. Um, and for me, like, it was probably a route through actually growing on allotments that started getting me to tune in to growing. And, and I'm someone that has to, like for my own mental well-being, I've discovered that one of the best things I do to remain sane and to manage my mental health is, is to garden and to, and to spend time in nature. And I experienced huge healing from that. And I was so privileged to come and live on this estate with really great green spaces. But then I kind of, then some disappointments crept in. And I think lots of people will know about some of those disappointments. They were realizing that some of the beautiful things that were being done weren't, weren't being allowed to thrive. And um, I'm sure lots of people know what a Lambeth haircut is, but it's a very square looking shrub. Um, and, um, and it's not like a, a sort of, what happens is you often don't actually see the full life cycle of it and and people don't know that it actually flowers um and and is a joy to behold and so and then you realize that we were paying for this privilege of having square shrubs and that actually it didn't need to be like that and so i got involved for a tra that was being really active that was saying look we want we want things to look better than what they are and we've been really privileged on Rosendale that has been in allotments on the estate for like 30 years. Um, so that was a real first plus. And um, the other things we've been quite good over the years at um, when someone, someone's interested in doing something on an estate at saying, yes, please. Um, and kind of jumping on it and being willing to work with them. And that's kind of resulted in us. We have an orchard of 10 fruit trees beautiful large space um, it was planted by funding from the orchard project we developed a community kitchen garden that came out of largely supported by urban growth who lambert had been funding for a number of years to support community food growing on estates um, and it was through like community gardeners working with us that helped kind of grow that growing residents get involved. We have like a rainwater garden and, um, and that was through the London Wildlife Trust as part of the Lost River Ephra project. And, and I guess, um, so that's some of the things we have. The latest, one of the latest things we're working on is a, um, we're, partnering up with Lambeth Friends of the Earth. And I'm pleased to say that the Open Orchard are coming on board as well um, from West Nord. We're, we're redesigning two large um, garden beds um, so that they're a completely different space to what they were because it got boring and tiring having the, the same arguments about how to keep it, how to keep everyone happy. So let's just redesign and let's just residents use the space in a different way. And that's, um, that's kind of started, but a lot more, that will happen over the next couple of years because the process needs to like have residents really own it. And, and we need to be a bit further out of the pandemic to be able to really have people fully participate. Um, so like that's some of it, but I guess I was asked about what some of the, what is the vision for your estate? And 
And part of our vision, I think Hopper probably says, oh, we want edibles in every bed on our estate. We want it all over our estate. We want fruit trees, we want soft fruit, we want herbs, we want perennial greens. We want children on our estate being able to just pick sorrel themselves and eat it and call it, call it um, sour leaf. And, you know, we want, we want people to experience that kind of connection and see kind of nature um, and, and the relationship with that. I guess too, like I talked about well-being, you know, and there's so much sort of sometimes science catches up with us. I work as a mental health nurse, so I'm quite passionate about mental health and stuff. And basically there are so much things about working with the soil that actually makes us feel better. It boosts our brain, you know, nature sounds, hearing the birds on our estate, hearing the wind blowing through our trees. This is the kind of stuff that kind of reduces stress and enhances kind of well-being. And um, so that's like a, people need to have these spaces and feel like the space is theirs, the space that they can um, really truly engage and be with it. More and more people are wanting to just look, plant things and look after the space right outside where they live. We need that to be made easier. We need it so that it's really transparent, like you just need, this is what you need to commit to when you do this. And this is how you do it. And, and that's fantastic. So part of that, part of the, it was how do people get involved? Well, we've done a lot with partner organizations. And I think this, as I mentioned, and you know, it's that whole connection with neighbors. You know, people like talking when they see people gardening. They come and say hello. You suddenly meet people who you've been living on their estate for over a decade and so have they, and you've never crossed paths and said hello. And this is the powerful connections that we kind of have made. And so I guess when you talk about what do we want for the future, what do I want to see for the future? You know, I want to, and I want the kids in our estate to grow up in a world where they can still have eat strawberries and pears and apples and blackberries. I want them to be able to have tomatoes and chilies and peppers, runner beans, squash, and all of those kind of vegetables. And they won't have them if we don't have pollinators. And this is why the, the pollinator plan is being put in place by Lambeth. It's because unless we maintain habitats for pollinators, then this is what we're losing. This is what we're losing, the things that we love to eat. And I guess part of that future is that um, I also want our, our estate should be destinations. We saw Vauxhall Square, Bonington Square, if we look at the brochures on some about some of our parks and spaces in Lambeth, all our housing estates should be places where people want to go and want to see the incredible nature, the incredible things that are going on in those environments. And, you know, we can kind of make that happen. I want to see suds. So I want to see rainwater gardens, swales, living roofs, kind of all over kind of our estates. The other thing I want though, I want, I want when we're making decisions about money to remember that we've got things like Myattsfield greenhouses. We've got the open orchard project in West Norwood. We've had people like Urban Growth. It's not only that they come and just do these things, they help support us maintain them. And this is a really vital thing. And this is also what Incredible Edibles doing. They're helping us maintain these spaces, not just setting them up and then abandoning them. Um, because I want a future where we all relearn skills, the skills of seed saving, of propagation, of pruning. You know, these are things that we're losing and we should hopefully be able to pass on to others. And I really want the ward councillors, like, I remember when the councillor for housing came to our estate, I don't want a housing officer or councillor to come to our estate and be able to tell the gardens that residents look after and the ones that the council landscapers look after. They need to be, they need to be on a par. They don't need to be so dramatically different that it's so noticeable. You know, and I think I just want a thing where it's easier for all of us to do. And the last thing I want, I'd say, we need to, when we're making decisions for the future, we need to start looking at some things from the pollinators. 
we need to start thinking, what does a bee need? What, is a, what do birds need? What do worms need? Not just what we need, what do they need as well? And then we will have these incredible spaces that we all kind of crave. And um, so, yeah, that's, I guess that's my, um, that's, my, <laughs> that's my little bit. Thanks everyone, thanks for asking me. Patrick, yeah, people are clapping. Um, yeah, and I, I think I'd just like to say, I know that the council want that too. Linda says thumbs up. Um, I know that this is something that can change and that the council has the will to change and wants to see this happen, but it's going to happen faster and better if residents step up and um, express their desire for that change and um, yeah transform these spaces which as um, Judy showed there are beautiful spaces in Lambeth already I know Caldwell are here today um, they've done an amazing job in their space and um, Annie's here um, from Cowley which um, they, she set up food growing there a long time ago in wildflower meadows there are there are little patchworks of activities and things happening um, but we want it all to come together and um, I just um, it's 656 four minutes um, there's been lots of um, chat which I'm really pleased about um, I wanted to just um, flag one thing um, that IEL is also doing which links in really well with all of this work um, and we are working with Arab to map the borough for existing and potential food growing. Uh, so Arab are doing this pro bono work where they are looking at a load of data but the, the key thing where all of you are needed is this is a citizen-led project and go out into the borough um, there's an app on our website. If you go to Lambeth Plots, uh, you can find that app and you can identify a space where you think food growing could take place. Um, all the things that we're doing, they all link together. Um, they're all important. And we just want to see uh, a thriving uh, biodiverse borough where communities come together through these spaces and through growing food. Hey, so, Yes. Totally. Sorry to interrupt. Somebody's asked, Georgina's asked, how long, much longer will the mapping exercise be going on for? Um, well, Joe is here today, but I think it's the end of April that we're going to be stopping this, this citizen input. So you really need to get out in the next 10 days into it or further afield, go for a good walk, find those spaces and add them to the map. Um, Oh, Annie would like to say something. I think I have to unmute you, Annie. Hold on one second. Is that working? It is now, is it? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, hi everybody. This is wonderful to see. Um, my experience was starting something called the Cowley Food Farm um, and it was something that very much was you know, along the lines of your vision was my vision and our vision. Um, I'm now a ward councillor, um, but- And mayor. I, oh yeah, tomorrow, not yet. Not <laughs> tomorrow, congratulations. Mayor on Eve. Um, but the thing is, we came a cropper because our management organisation was quite hostile to what we were doing. And so I'd really like to make sure, and I'll do it from the council side, that, we, we don't come across, we, if somebody's managing properties and managing land, they manage it with our aims and vision in mind. And that's really important because I think we, uh, there's nothing more heartbreaking, nothing more heartbreaking than building something up and then just seeing, literally seeing it ripped down. You know, we had frogs, we had wildflowers, we had everything. So I'd, I'd like to see it, that vision firmed up in some sort of written contract to anybody who's charged with managing our lands and properties. That's all I can say. And it's wonderful. I'm, it's so wonderful to see you all. And you, Annie. Yeah, there has to be continuity. 
that is a critical thing that needs to be built in, isn't it? Um, yeah, yeah, it has to be. You know, the, if we believe that the, there should be no weed, you know, more pollinators and, and no weed killer, then that has to be written into management contracts if we're letting other people manage those lands for us. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Great. Um, Catherine's just asked something. Can we think of regeneration states who are in a tricky position with making the most of their space? Do you want to elaborate on that? Um, Catherine, I'll just see if I can um, unmute you. Catherine is from Central Hill. Thanks, Janie. Um, just quickly, um, I think we're, we're in a slightly delicate position um, of wanting to make the most of our space, but not knowing how long the space is going to be there for. So sometimes the conversations are, are a little bit more awkward about what, what we can do and um, what makes the estate too nice to knock down, <laughs> to, if I'm allowed to say that. Mm. Um, so um, that's just something to bear in mind that we've, you know, when I hear what other people are doing, it sounds wonderful, but I just, I, I don't know that we could do that here. And um, it's just, it's just nice to, we would like to do as much as we can while the estate's still here. Thanks. Yeah, and which is why I'm so thrilled that you have such a um, energetic group working on this project. I mean, it is a very sad thing that there are estates that have been under threat for, for years and years and living with that. Um, threat um, and um, I don't have the answers but I think that if we can make our estates beautiful then maybe we can stop them being demolished but I don't know um, ah, yes Georgina is saying regeneration and demolition needs to be rethought let's not go down that track right now because it's um it's a sad one but um it, does anybody have any final thoughts because i like to keep these things to an hour no then i will um oh poppy can you unmute yeah i was just gonna say thanks so much for everybody for coming and really if you have anything you want to is this, if this has brought up any questions or you want to connect with us about anything to do with greening estates and how to connect in with the council, any support we can give you, please do contact us through the IEL website and we would love to connect. I, th I think a lot of it is about networking and creating a network of people who can support each other. So do, do connect in with us. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Poppy. Yes, if you're not if you're not yet a member, um, join us. Join this net. We're a network of networks, and um, we can support you and help you. Um, I've just unmuted Rob because I think you'd like to say something. We've been talking about pollinators. Lambeth's going to spray the streets starting May fourth. Um, I've put the link there where you can opt out if the estates aren't being um, sprayed, but you can opt. You can opt out your adjacent streets. Um, the more of us that can actually opt out, the better. And we're and, and the same thing will be the same in August. And then the council's moving over to non-chemical uh, methods for controlling what they call weeds, road plants on the pavements. Um, but please, please, please do register. Um, you have to go through a, a heap of bureaucracy, become a street champion, you can reverse that later, and a whole heap of other nonsense, but you'll save some fees and you'll save us from uh, human cancers, so thank you. Yeah, thanks for highlighting that, Rob. It's really important to um, opt out if you um, live on a, a street. Estates are meant to be no longer spraying. Um, that is not the case for housing association estates necessarily, so it might be worth checking if you live on a housing association estate whether they're still spraying. We've got to stop the spraying of pesticide. Anyway, thank you, thank you, thank you for coming. Thank you for everybody's amazing contributions. Thank you to Judy, Jerome, Siobhan, Poppy, Patrick. Um, really inspiring evening. I hope you all go away and feel excited about a greener Lambeth. Okay. And thank bye you to everyone. Janie for bringing it all together. Oh, pleasure. Okay. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye. Thank bye. you.